Hello everyone, good morning, good afternoon and good evening wherever you are. I'm Kanika Bharadwaj, the Marketing Manager at ESSEC Business School. Along with us today, we have Anne Fleur, the Academic Director of the Executive Master in International Business Development. Hello Anne Fleur. Hi Kanika. She, today she will be leading this masterclass on cross-cultural communication and management where she will be sharing with some tips with you. Feel free to ask any question that you may have uh, during the presentation on the chat box next to the live and we will try to address them at the end of the session. So with that, uh, I will leave the floor to you, Anne Fleur. Thank you, Kanita, for, uh, for your introduction. So maybe before I start with uh, the content of my presentation, I will start with introducing myself. So basically, my name is Anne-Flore mamon -Lahofi. I am um, an academic director at the SEC Business School of several programs, including uh, one in executive education, which is called the Master Specialisé uh, in, in International Business Development. But I'm also an alumnus from the school uh, several times. So I did the uh, IBD program um, a couple of years ago. And then I did my PhD as well at the SEC. So it's a long, um, long story, I would say, with the school. Um, so um, the idea of today is to introduce you to a topic which is very important, which is this idea of uh, cross-cultural communication, um, which is probably one of the most important reasons why sometimes you have um, you know, international development strategies which succeed very well, and sometimes why they fail very well as well. <laughs> Um, and especially, this is something which is key um, when you want to develop your business, but also when you go, for example, for a merger and acquisition, um, you know, negotiating contracts, establishing some partnerships with your clients or with uh, subcontractors um, or with governments. So, of course, here we are. We only have a couple of uh, minutes, I would say, together. Um, so, my, my idea is to share with you some keys uh, to cope with this ever-growing challenge. And especially, um, I would like to introduce you to the concept of cultural intelligence, which is like, you know, um, what we call emotional intelligence. Maybe you've heard that before. So cultural intelligence, what is that and how can we uh, develop it, um, you know, as a soft skill or personal individual? So um, as an introduction, I would like to uh, start over with uh, coming back to the, the words. Uh, we speak of cross-cultural communication. So there is one concept in this title, which is communication, the concept of communication. And even though it looks like very basic, I think it's important to go back to the definition of communication because it has evolved also with, uh, with science. It has evolved with um, um, globalization things, but also with uh, consumers and how their metacognition has become more and more important with years. So when we speak of communication, basically, what is this? We have a sender. We have someone who wants to say something to someone else. Okay, so let's say, for example, me, I'm, I'm trying to say something, I'm trying to tell something to you. So I'm the information source, okay? I, will want, I, will, I mean, I want to send a message, so to send my message, I'm going to encode my message. What do I mean by encode? I'm going to choose words, I'm going to choose features, uh, maybe I will have a little bit, you don't see me because it's Zoom, but uh, you would see otherwise my body gesture, uh, body language. Uh, maybe I will also choose some uh, colors, um, whatever, you know, but I'm going to encode what I want to say so that it becomes a message. This message is then going to be sent to someone through what we call a channel of communication. So you are going to choose your media, for example. Do I use uh, oral communication, written communication? Do I use a TV? Do I use radio? Do I use paper, print, whatever? Okay, but I'm choosing my channel. How do I hold the whole? Do I um, share my message? Then you have someone who is going to receive this information and he's going to decode the information he's receiving. Okay, so he's going to interpret what he's hearing, what he's seeing. I say he, but it might be a she, of course. <laughs> so this person is called the receiver. And based on what this person understands from the communication, he is going to provide what we call some feedback. So he's going to um, react upon the communication, share some feedback, uh, which might be purchase, for example, the act of purchase, but it might be other things, of course. All this would be very simple if it would happen in a blend area, but this is never happening. There is always what we call the noise. So the noise is all the little things which are happening, um, you know, in the environment, which are um, 
moderating, which are alter, which are um, alterating, sorry, um, the perception of the message. Okay, so for example, uh, social um, social momenta, uh, for example, uh, competitors' communication. Um, the moment where people get uh, exposed to the communication. Okay, if you if you are exposed to a communication in front of TV while you are cooking, it's not the same thing as if it, if it is while you are watching TV, really watching, not just having it open, switched on. Sorry. Okay, so this is what we call communication. What's happening is that well, we have an encoding process, encoder, decoder, and as you all know, when we speak of a code, there is a, a code system. And this is exactly what trust control, control communication is about, is how do we make sure that even if we have different code systems, we understand each other. Okay? So in the end, what we try to do with, um, I mean, what we try to do in business when we want to work on our cross-cultural cross communication skills, we try to build this bridge so that what I want to tell you, you understand what I wanted to tell you. Okay? There is this bridge. It's not broken. Alors, then, why on earth um, are we speaking of this importance of uh, cross-cultural communication? Well, um, I thought it would be very interesting and important for you to put back uh, this into a context, which is a context of expatriation. Because when you um, are going international, when you work international, often you become what we call an expat. Alors, an expat may be a, a situation you experience during several years, or it may be a situation you experience only during several weeks. But whatever the duration, I would say, of your stay, at the end of the day, you face the same challenges. So here, um, I wanted uh, to have your opinion, your thought about being an expat. So I suggest, what I suggest is that all of you, you connect to um, the URL that you have on the top of the screen, but I think it's also shared by Kanika in the, in the chat area. So it's uh, www.bcast.live slash 8CEV. Go really on the dot .live at slash 8CEV, okay? So you can connect with your mobile phone. We don't care of your name. Just put something random. We don't care. Okay, and I would like you to participate in this little quiz, which is, um, I, I mean, I would like you to share with me a picture which is for you describing the situation of being an expat. Okay, so you, you choose a picture on uh, Google, let's say, Google image, okay, and you choose this picture. So, and you upload, sorry, the picture. So I'm going to launch the, the activity. So you can start participating. It's launched. And as soon as we get some pictures, I will share with you the results. Maybe some of you have been in an expatriation situation and you can um, share your experience. Okay, I see some pictures coming in.
Okay, so we have several pictures. Not so many, I see some of you are very shy. Okay, so um, let's let's share my screen, the other one. So I will have to stop this screen sharing and share the other one. Okay. Here it is. So we only have a couple of, uh, we only have three pictures, but I think it's already, you know, four pictures. So it's already an interesting uh, uh, results. It's supposed to load. like um, okay so you get it now yeah i see it okay great so we have uh, several pictures which appear on the screen so we have this guy who is walking you know in front of a landscape uh, with the luggage so this this feeling you know of being always uh traveling when you are an expat you, you never at you never at home there is also the, the discovery of new landscapes, um, the discovery of new areas, like this woman who is walking toward a castle. And then we have um, an example of um, a weird product which I found uh, in a country. So I think I, it's bigger on my screen here, but it's, uh, it's a tomato sauce. So it's basically, uh, you know, to put in your pasta, but it has the shape of a yogurt, which is something which is not common, I would say, for European people. So the idea of some, some things become weird to us. Okay, so going back to the PowerPoint, <laughs> it's a back and forth process, of course. Okay, should be. Okay, thank you. Okay, so um, when we um, when we become an expat, uh, we this is a, this is what's happening. Uh, first of all, there is what we call the home country assignment. Okay. So um, you, you are at home and someone is going to uh, eventually recruit you to go international. This person is going to make you enter in a recruitment process and is going to select you. If you are lucky, um, the HR person is going to uh, select you based on objective criteria. She knows exactly what you should have in terms of skills and there won't be any mistake in your recruitment. Unfortunately, sometimes it's not always the case and sometimes you are recruited to go abroad and it's not the best situation for you. But this is um, what's happening. So they, they oriented you towards the new expat uh, tasks. They assign you to a foreign country, which sometimes you choose, sometimes you don't choose. And then um, regularly, when you are an expat, they are going to debrief you. Okay? After the debrief and after a couple of months or years, you go back to your country. And at the end of the day, you come back to your home country assignment. So it's a whole cycle. It's pretty rare that an expat remains an expat forever. There is always a moment when he's or she is coming back, back home. And this is going to be um, related to some kind of um, psychological process. So here um, I have a curve which is um, called the reloc relocation sorry, transition curve, which is, yeah. It's working. Um, alors, this curve is not mine. Uh, it has been designed by a professor from ESSEC, uh, Mr. Serdan. Uh, he has worked his whole life on uh, the expat feeling. And um, he has observed, you know, some students who left school and then 10 years after, 20 years after, you know, what, what they have become. And uh, he has designed some uh, model. Uh, it's, a, it's a modelization that you have behind. And this is exactly what is happening when you uh, become an expat. Okay, so on the axis you have time and on the uh, vertical axis you have perceived competence. So how much you perceive yourself as a competent person. So at the beginning, let's say you, you arrive in a new country, it's a kind of unreal feeling. Okay, the feeling that the relocation is a dream. So basically everything looks like, you know, amazing, nice. Oh, it's so great, it's so good, people, it's so, the food is so great, the landscape is so great. Uh, new areas, new etc. So the next step is really, I'm, I'm really, really competent. I mean, what we call fantasia. Okay, so this was what, what was written, the feeling of enchantment and the excitement of the new environment. You are really, really super excited. And then after a couple of days or a couple of weeks, you start, you know, uh, inquiring a little bit deeper. You explore the environment and you realize little by little that this environment is very different from your home. Very, very different. So you study and then you see it's different. And then what's happening is from difference comes question mark. Am I competent? Am I the right person to be here? 
uh, is this really possible for me? And then you see the curve is going to go down. And there is this very um, uh, dangerous moment for companies where the expat person feels very, very, very um, unfit to the situation. Okay, And there is a risk that this person remains down. Of course, if you don't remain down, then you are going to, thanks to especially cultural intelligence, okay, because this is number four is really due to cross-cultural things. Okay, so thanks to this plasticity that you will, you will have when you face um, international uh, development, you are going to start uh, explore and test new approaches, challenge yourself, uh, practice new things, listen to people, um, you know, develop a new way of doing. Okay, so you are in an experimental phase. And then you go back into more and more perceived competence. And then when you have done that, you go in the next phase, which is really um, a set kind of self-reflection process. Why have I succeeded in doing that? Why I'm doing it well? Okay, so you create new models. You integrate in your way of doing new, um, new things, which you would have never thought before. But this is because of the exposure to the new country that at the end of the day, you become someone new. Okay. So it's a new road for you and you integrate some new skills and new behavior and then you accept your new environment. Okay, so you become some kind of new expert in this new environment and you are because you have a passive competence which is very high. The problem is that usually when you are at number seven, people make you go back home. And when you go back home, you feel like a stranger in your own country. And then you go back to the curve. Okay, so this is this is kind of cycle which is happening to uh, to expats. So how to go from four to five and not to remain in four? This is really working uh, by working, sorry, on your cross-cultural skills. Okay, so being cross-cultural, I have a little quiz for you. So it's the same URL as earlier. You can participate very easily. You can go in the quiz. I will launch a quiz. It's a couple of questions, very funny questions, I promise. Um, and you can take the quiz uh, in four seconds. It should show up on your screen. So I let you take the quiz, sir. It's only six questions. Going to go on the results slide. I see some people have finished, so sorry, I share a different screen. Oh, this is the one. It's not so easy, yeah? <laughs>
Waiting for the last person, I think. Yes, done. So let me take the results and display the podium. So, well, we have many people with uh, great uh, replies. Most of you did very well. So what were the answers? Let me, uh, let me uh, go there through them one by one. So for a meeting at 10 a.m. in Germany, you should arrive at 10 a.m. No, it's too late, guys. If you want to be on time in Germany, you have to arrive in advance, at least 10 minutes ahead. I should have mentioned that all these situations are situations I've gone through personally, but <laughs> that's a different idea. When meeting an Egyptian for business, the first thing to do is to ask about his family. Yes, you have to do it. And it's not only for Egyptians, right? it's also for uh, North African countries. You should invite for dinner at 4.35 p.m. in Denmark. Yes, this is the time at, at which they eat uh, dinner, while in France we are eating pain au chocolat. So it's really a cross-cultural different thing. You're in Japan, the client gives you his card, you should take it with your left hand only. No, never, ever, because the left hand is a hand you keep for hygiene. Okay, so you, you don't uh, use it for giving a business card, it's going to be very rude. You are making a series of proposals and your Bulgarian counterpart keeps nodding her head. Um, this means that he, oh, it's, it's she, sorry, this means that she agrees. Uh, no, it was wrong because uh, in some uh, emerging countries, developing economies, uh, basically nodding the head like that means no, and doing like that means yes. Uh, Gift given is part of business etiquette in Southeast Asia. Yes, it's a reality, so um, it's not corruption, okay, it's, it's tradition. So then it becomes sometimes a challenge when you, when you are in a company which is abiding by the Anti-Corruption Act it might be a kind of challenge because you have to go for business gift, but <laughs> normally you should not. So um, do you, you know, I mean, we hear these debates um, in the press all the time. Okay, so I switch back to my PowerPoint. Okay. Great. Okay, so I just had a couple of uh, other uh, things to illustrate cross-cultural miscommunication. So the fact that the encoding and the decoding is not the same. So here you have uh, this uh, international rival in the airport and you have uh, uh, this uh, Japanese person who is uh, handing the cards and says when he's going to take my card, but the probably American guy, he's one of the French guy wants to shake the hand and he doesn't know what to do. And then you've got the Latin American person who is like uh, really to kiss on the cheek. Uh, and then you have another one who is like, wow, personal space invasion, probably American guy. And then you have the, the Indian who's like, next, uh, I'm next, what should I do? You know, very <laughs> like. So you see, uh, um, customs, habits are, can be very different from one country to the other one. This is coming from culture, because culture is something which is going to affect your perception, which is influencing your behavior and which is shaping your personal ideas. So it's really part of people, it's really part of individuals, and you have to work on that if you want to be successful at an international level as a manager. So culture, at the end of the day, is like an iceberg. Um, you have the visible behaviors, what we had on the slide just before, okay, what can be observed. And then you have all the invisible sources which are going to shape the visible behaviors. Attitudes, expectations, beliefs, assumptions, values, Okay, and all that, you need to work on that, and you need to, sorry, I come back to this one, if you want to be a successful manager internationally, you need to understand all that. Attitudes, expectations, beliefs, assumptions, values, and as part of values, you have the religious systems, very important, because religion is going to shape the value in the, in the society. Alors, um, how, um, how do we... Um, I mean, um, how do we address this idea of uh, becoming a successful leader um, and coping with cross-cultural miscommunication? Well, we speak of uh, the fact that um, culture is going to impact several aspects. So the visible behaviors you had on the slide before, okay, it's going to influence communication and management styles. You don't have the same style of management if you are in Singapore and if you are in France or if you are in Morocco. Uh, the attitudes towards conflict, people don't react the same way. In some cultures, you avoid conflict. In others, you go for conflict. The approaches to completing tasks, uh, how do people uh, manage a project, is going to be very cultural related. 
Decision making styles, how do we make our make up our mind? Attitudes toward disclosure, very important, especially when we speak, you know, of um, uh, sharing public publicly some information which in some countries is considered as private and in others is considered as public. Uh, for example, if you go in the US, it's uh, it's normal to know how much people have paid their home and how much uh, their salary is. Uh, in France, this is something which is not shared uh, publicly. And also the approaches to knowing. Um, in some cultures, uh, theories are valued over practice. And in other countries, it's more practice over theory. So it really depends on the cultural background. So I have some examples for you to, for me sorry, to illustrate my points. So for example, in terms of management styles, here you have uh, several countries, Germany, France, China, and Japan. Uh, so Germany is in green, France in blue, China in uh, black, and Japan is red. And you have several dimensions of the management side. So for example, let's take direct or um, negative feedback. So if you have to say that to your employee that he is uh, messing up, well, you see that in Germany uh, or in France, we are going to be quite direct. Okay, we say you are messing up. Uh, if you go to Japan, you never do it in a direct way, and in China as well, because it's a lot of face. Okay. Um, if you go for uh, looking for, um, I mean, the decision making process. Okay, who is deciding? Well, in Japan, it's a consensual. Everyone should agree. Uh, in Germany as well, it's kind of, you know, we, we, we discuss with people, we make something together and then we try to make a collective decision out of that. Uh, if you go to China, it's top down, okay, the boss is deciding for the rest of the people. So here, you, I mean, I'm not going to go through all dimensions because it would be very boring, but it's just, I wanted to show you something very obvious on this one. You see that China, for example, black is always on the right, and Germany, in most cases, green is always on the left. Okay, so if you take left versus right, <laughs> you see that those two cultures are very, very opposed, very different. So if you have a merger, for example, in between two companies, a German company and a Chinese company, there is a high chance that it's going for a failure. I'm not saying it's going to be always a failure, but if people don't try to understand how others uh, work out and you put a German manager in China or a Chinese manager in Germany, it's never gonna work. As, I mean, except if this person is um, going through what we call an acculturation process. Okay, so taking into account the other's culture and integrating that in his management style. Can you go back to my uh, slides, please? So I don't see otherwise. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, then another example is negotiation. Negotiation. So negotiation is what? Negotiation of the salary, negotiation of the contract, negotiation with the public entities. And you see that here you have two dimensions how much people put emotions in the negotiation, which is the vertical axis. And then on the horizontal axis is whether people go for confrontation or avoid confrontation. And there, there, sorry, again, you see that countries are very different and that some countries are really at the opposite stage of the grid. So again, if you take Japan, for example, and Israel, very difficult. Or if you take Saudi Arabia and Germany, very difficult. And then you have some people who are more in the middle, like UK and US. And US is like, you know, almost in the middle. So this is, this means that it's kind of easy for American people to go into whatever directions. And it's easy for other, other countries to go with collaboration, I mean, negotiation with American people because American people are a little bit in the middle. So it's an advantage for this culture. I don't remember where we are, France, oh yeah, top left, yeah. Confrontational and emotionally expressive. French people, it's like Italian, you know, we express emotions. Communication styles, very interesting comparison as well. Um, English style of communication, straight to the point, conciseness, uh, very direct. Then you've got uh, the romantic way of doing things, so French or Italian way of doing. So here, uh, to remain polite in a conversation, you are going to take details. So when we say details, what it is, it is we go for a conversation which has nothing to do with the initial communication, okay? We, we go uh, while we are speaking and communicating, for example, uh, on business, at some point, we leave that aside and we go for something else and we speak of something which has nothing to do, like, you know, the last uh, lasagna recipe you've done or whatever. Really, really uh, nothing to do. Then there is uh, the Jedaic uh, way of doing things, which is uh, what we find, uh, so it's called Jedaic, but it's what you find more in Arabic countries, actually. 
So all Arabic countries and of course Israel. And uh, it's the fact that it's, they are going straight to the point, but sometimes they're like, oh, but that's another story. Oh, but that's another story. Oh, but that's another story. Okay, so it's not really straight to the point. It's at some moment, it changes. With romantic way of seeing, of doing, you see, like you go in a somewhere else. <laughs> it's not even the straight to the point. And then you have the Asian way of doing things, which is like, you know, going around, never saying things directly, uh, trying to make people understand what you are willing to say without saying it, uh, because you don't want to lose face, or you don't want people to, your, to lose face. So you are always, as we say in French, tourné autour du pot, as we say in French. So you always want uh, to try to avoid the direct uh, communication. Alors, as part of cross-cultural communication, we have the challenge of language. Because when we say, uh, okay, I'm going to learn a new language, I'm going to be an expert in China, I'm going to learn Chinese. Well, the problem is that language is not only about words. Um, language is composed of two several components, verbal language and non-verbal language. And in miscommunication, sometimes you have miscommunication also in non-verbal language. So language, what is this? When you want to master uh, another language to avoid miscommunication due to language, you need to understand the words, the tone of the speech, and also the accents, okay, the accents in the country. Then you have all the non-verbal language, which is about the perception of time. Uh, you know, um, in some countries, like in Italy, they speak very, very fast, very, very fast. In other countries, they take more the time, they pause. There is also the idea of space, silence, how much silence you put in the conversation. Uh, material possessions, the importance of, um, for example, uh, having uh, signaling things, logos, um, logo, uh, the, the, the handbag that you have, the clothes that you wear, it's going to be more or less important, but it's going to communicate something about you in some countries. Okay? If you have the latest Hala shoes in some countries, this is meaning something about you. Uh, friendship patterns is part of language as well. What do you consider a friend? If you go in uh, Italy, everyone is a friend. My friend, my friend, my friend. Everyone is a friend. Okay. Uh, if you go in uh, Germany or in the northern part of France, uh, this is a um, this is a, a label you you owe. Okay. You you need to owe it. It's not automatic. And of course, then it's going to be also business agreements. So do we agree for business just shaking a hand, or do we take uh, ten lawyers with us? You know. Uh, to, to actually go for this agreement. Okay, this was just to illustrate time. Okay, New York are out for breakfast, Munich are having a coffee break, and Tokyo are at lunch. Basically, we are, we are usually at uh, 10, 10 a.m. Okay, but you see that in Munich, you have a coffee break in Tokyo, you eat your lunch, and in New York, you are just for breakfast. <laughs> so you, you don't have the same customs and habits. Another illustration of language issue, body gesture. UK and USA, this sign means, okay, no, I should do it in the other hand. Oh, I'm not sure how you see me. Uh, it's okay. Uh, Russia, it means zero. Japan, it means money. And in Brazil, it's an insult. So, well, this is something you need to know before you go in the countries, of course. Are you going to tell me, okay, well, that's complex, Miss Maman. How do we do? <laughs> so what? Well, so what um, I would like to share with you this quote, uh, this quote sorry, by Edward uh, Hall, who is a researcher who wrote a lot of books, and especially he wrote a book on the, uh, the language of silence, so how silent is the language in itself. And he said that the essence of cross-cultural communication has more to do with releasing responses than with sending messages. It is more important to release the right response than to send the right message. So basically, if you want to be a successful manager when you go abroad, it's not about saying or doing the right things. It's about um, being plastic when you face a situation you don't understand, when you face people you don't understand or you feel it's weird, and having this plasticity to display an appropriate behavior to those people, or at least to avoid having uh, the wrong behavior. Why do we care? Because cross-cultural misunderstanding may lead to m &A failure, animosity feelings in the host country, boycott of products, nervous breakdowns among employees, loss of corporate credibility, brand image damage in home country due to global bad publicity, etc. Okay? So this is why HR people are going to try to find um, expats who have this cultural intelligence I was describing. 
Okay, so the cultural intelligence is the road to success. So what is cultural intelligence? It's something which is based on Aristotle, the Greek. Okay, he said he who cannot be a good follower cannot be a good leader. If you want to be a good manager, you need to be a good follower first. So if you want to succeed at an international level, if you want to be a good manager globally, you first need to be a good follower in the country where you are going to. So cultural intelligence is going to be the plasticity you display when meeting new and unknown cultures. It's a must-have soft skill to be a great leader. It's a complementary skill to emotional intelligence, and it's really your saver road. It's a skill that you are going to build during all your career. Okay, it's not something you learn in a book just once. You are going to shape it and to learn and to uh, make it evolve and to enrich it year after year, month after month, day after day. Cultural intelligence starts with knowing yourself. Now, this is not the, real, the best uh, pleasing situation. You first have to make a little bit of an audit of yourself. Okay, knowing yourself, knowing my culture. Okay, me, I'm Anne Fleur, I'm French. What makes me French? What are my way of reacting? What is my negotiating style? Uh, how do I uh, like emotions or not in conversation and confrontation or not? Okay, knowing myself, it starts here. If you don't know how your culture is impacting yourself, you will never manage to be a successful uh, manager abroad. So you first need to make an audit of yourself. Then it's about knowing others. So you have to make your homework. You have to research in the country. You are going to a country, different country. You are going to learn maybe the language. You are going to um, read things about how they behave. You are going to watch movies, read novels. Uh, you are going maybe to speak with people coming from this country which are already working in your comp company. Um, or me, for example, I, I discuss a lot with my students, a lot, because they bring me so much in terms of you know uh, knowledge from all the countries. And then, when you know who you are and when you know where you go, you are able to be a good follower, like Aristotle was saying. So you can lead, in a way. So this is exactly what I described already. The steps to raise your cultural quotient is knowledge, I mean, it starts already with mindfulness, bottom right, knowledge about others, and then uh, shaping the correct behavioral skills. So shaping your behavior so that at the end of the day, wherever you go, wherever you meet, you are able to um, display a behavior which is appropriate and which is not shocking other people. Culture is pervasive. Everyone, every organization, every region and every country has a culture. Don't assume that because France is close to Switzerland or that in Switzerland they have a German Switzerland and Italian Switzerland, that Italian Switzerland is the same as Italy. No, no, okay, even regions have different things, okay, like northern part of France or the southern part of France, different cultures, subcultures, if we may. So don't assume that culture is, uh, it can be the same from one country to the other one. It's not because it's Asia that it's the same, okay, Taiwan and China is different, point. Then it's about understanding cultural beliefs, values and perceptions of others, which is the key to your success, and vice versa, of course. Learning diverse cultural heritage is rewarding, inspiring, and empowering. Teamwork in the increasingly global and various workplace is impossible without cultural intelligence. But the idea is to be on the us instead of the them, okay, together. Okay, it's not them, it's not they are weird. What they eat is weird. No, it's about us. How do we make it happen? Relationships start with understanding of where the other people are coming from and acceptance of their style of, um, of their point of view, sorry, and of their style. So uh, this is uh, the plasticity I was describing, okay? There is nothing which is weird. It's just different from you. Maybe you don't understand, but that's a different point. It's not weird, it's not bad, it's not, you know, it's like when you have, uh, sometimes you hear tourists in areas and they're like, oh, they don't eat very well, the food is disgusting in this country. No, it's not disgusting, it's just like different from what you are used to, point. Okay, but often you hear that from French or Italian people. <laughs> and the last one is that exploiting cultural diversity is the key to unlimited innovation and growth. There are a lot of studies which show that from diversity, especially cultural diversity, when you have um, 
diverse, diverse uh, teams in companies, uh, the companies are much more innovative and they have better, um, better uh, profits at the end of the day. So uh, when, of course, the management is working. Uh, uh, but uh, this idea of having multicultural teams is bringing um, lots of uh, success and uh, positive returns for companies, and especially in terms of innovation, because creativity is going to be richer when you have different people, of course. So the road to success is coming back to what we said, you need to be uh, able to distinguish linear time and flexible time, the rules uh, in the country versus the relationships, um, the, the status that you get from you, who you are versus the status that you get from what you do, uh, whether people are oriented towards the group or towards the individuals, and whether everything is more direct or indirect. Okay, so you need to understand all those components. It's really a self-reflection process. And honestly, I mean, um, I've been in the contact, I mean, in contact with uh, culturally diverse people. For me, when I say culturally diverse, I mean really foreign people, not even culturally diverse in, in France, uh, since maybe high school, maybe just after high school, you know, uh, so it's quite quite time, and I'm still learning. I'm still not yet yet there. Okay. So in conclusion, what can we say? Well, there are ten strategies for effective cross cultural communication. First of all, you need to build yourself awareness, know who you are. Then you have to acknowledge, recognize the complexity. It's not simple. It's not because uh, uh, Singapore is close to Malaysia that it's the same. Okay. Avoid stereotyping. Avoid stereotyping. There, is, of course, there are stereotypes for, for cultures and, and countries, but you should try to avoid that. To be open-minded. Respect differences. Nothing is weird. Nothing is weird. Listen actively. You are going to learn so much from listening instead of just uh, you know uh, saying things. Be honest. Okay, be honest. If you don't know something, say it. If you don't understand something, ask. Ask. Sometimes you don't understand why people do that. Ask why it's like that. And if you make a mistake, apologize. There is nothing wrong with apologize. You know, it's, it's, it's good. Be flexible. Be flexible. Also, think twice before saying or doing something. Always challenge before doing it, especially when you face other employees or business partners. Ask questions. I've already said that. And the last one, distinguish perspectives. Okay, try to say, okay, there is this perspective, that there is also this one, and also this one, and maybe taking the three perspectives together, we are going to build a successful formula. And at the end of the day, and I will finish on that, you will manage uh, to, to abide by this quote by Nelson Mandela. If you talk to a man in a language that he understands, that goes to his head, if you talk to him in his language, that goes to his heart. And at the end of the day, being a successful manager at an international level, it's speaking to the heart of people. Well, that was just an illustration of differences. Thank you all for your um, for your uh, for, I mean, for your listening. Um, I think we can now open it to questions. We have a couple of minutes for questions. Um, I also shared with you on the screen my email address, which is probably the easiest one in the school, <laughs> at least for French-speaking people. Uh, you can contact me. I'm also, um, of course, very willing to share with you my PowerPoint if you want the slides. Uh, so you can just uh, send me an email, and I will reply uh, very, uh, very gently. And just to, to finish on, uh, before taking your questions, um, just uh, maybe to, to share, this is exactly this cross-cultural plasticity, this cultural quotient that I spoke about, is exactly what we try uh, to train our uh, participants to acquire in some uh, of our programs. So all the international programs that we have at ESSEC, so of course the one I, ma I manage, international business development, but also in our global MBA or in our executive MBA, we try to train people to get this plasticity and to uh, open their perspectives. 
Thank you so much, Aunt Flower, for this very interesting masterclass. I think uh, even for me, it was very interesting to get insights on cross-cultural communication. Um, we are now open to questions. So for just a reminder for everyone who is watching, you can share your questions on the chat, which is next to the live. And we have one question already. So I'm putting on the chat box for you, but I'm going to read it out loud so everyone can hear. Does the research say if the time span of the seven stage curve, is it impacted by the gap between the home country culture and the new country culture? Uh, or is it only a personal temporality? Uh, thank you for this question. It's a very interesting question, actually. Uh, and, and there is no proof in the research uh, that it's, it's related to the gap between the home country and the host country. But uh, there is a, an impact of um, the past experience of the expats. Like if the person has already been an expat before, um, or basically if this person is already, um, you know, culturally uh, quotient uh, high <laughs> in, uh, in some way. So the more you, 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 you have been uh, in, uh, in a cross-cultural context, uh, the less you feel this, uh, this, this curve. I mean, the, the more the curve is going to be flat at the end of the day. Great. It's a, it's a good, uh, I mean, it's a good uh, assumption. Um, yeah, it's true. It's very interesting because uh, I myself, like I see a lot of differences because I am not from France and I live here and, and little by little I see myself adapting so much to the culture here. But now I see a little differences with India also. So it's, it's, it's quite interesting to see how we merge uh, from home yeah. country to another country. And thank you. And probably, can you, tell you know, probably uh, if you go to uh, another European country, which is culturally yeah. quite close, I would say to France, like for example, Italy, even though it's very different. Huh? But if you go to Italy, maybe you are going to adapt yourself uh, faster than if you came directly from India to Italy. Yes, I know what you mean. It's true. Even though, uh, I mean, uh, I live partly in Italy and uh, there are things which are like always surprising me, which I, I'm laughing because I'm not going to give you examples. But <laughs> it's basically so funny, you know, the first time I arrived, I was like, oh my gosh. And now every time I go back, I know it's real. I mean, it's real. I know it's different, but it's yeah. like, you know, so, yeah. and, and we are both like two, two neighboring countries. But I think in India, Kanika, it's even more important for you because India is such a huge country that even in between two different regions, people don't speak the same language. So it means that the exactly. culture is... It's, it's, yeah. it's absolutely true. So that's also something which I think played a role in my adaptability here in Europe because within India, the cultures are so different. So when I traveled from one place to another, I had to adapt completely uh, uh, to the region. And it's true that when I moved to Europe, I felt, okay, that's just like another region, but of course there's a lot of differences. Uh, yes. as well. But but you're right, uh, you're right. It, it makes, it. you still see differences and I think I'll be faster to that. I'll, I'll give you feedback when I travel to Italy next. <laughs> okay, what's happening? Great. Um, I am looking at the chat box. I do not see any other questions. Maybe we'll wait for five more seconds for if someone has a question that they can sh they can put it on the chat box. If not, we will end there. You know, just to give you an example of uh, of cross cultural thing, which is a funny one. I had a, a Zoom conference um, last week with um, a school in the UK, uh, King's College, which is which which we are working on a double degree. Yeah. And um, they saw my background, which is here. I've just moved, and I mean, uh, my, my office is currently in a place which used to be a bedroom. So this is why I still have this uh, this top on the on the on the wall. And uh, we were, she, and they were like, "Oh, it's so nice, but you have behind." And my answer was, "Oh yes, it's very British style." Mm -hmm. And their reply was, "No, it's not British style. It's completely French style." <laughs> and we were like, "You know, it's so funny." But for me, this is typically the English-looking, you know, wallpaper. Mm -hmm. But for uh, for British people, it's typically the French wallpaper. So this is just, it's you know, a very tiny example, which, uh, which is like, okay. <laughs> and that's true. It's, it's we don't realize back in history where these uh, little nuances are borrowed from and if you try to track down i think we'll be able to figure out where this originally comes probably it's not yeah. even british or french it might be borrowed well, from another country completely so it's it's so interesting it's very interesting um with that we have one more question um so someone is asking if there is a document that they can refer 
to when wanting to prepare and learn more about other cultures to avoid missteps when they are there in the country? Um, I know. There won't be a document, you know, which is like uh, the Bible for everything. Alors, you may read the book. There is a book huh, about uh, cross-cultural communication. I don't remember who wrote that, but there is a book which is very, uh, it should be somewhere in my office. Can, uh, but you, you go on uh, Amazon and uh, you find it. Um, which is, but it's a little bit a theoretical book. Um, my recommendation is to try to... Um, uh, get used to the cultures through. Um, the, you can always find, you know, the book of business etiquette in China, in India, or whatever. It's always good to read. But I think the best you can get in terms of feedback and knowledge is uh, through uh, cultural exposure. And what I mean by cultural exposure is discussing with people. So if 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 you you know someone or you know someone who knows someone who is coming from uh, uh, the other country, I think you get so much from there. And I also think that the cultural productions are very interesting. Alors, it's not the reality. When you watch uh, when you watch uh, Bollywood movies, Bollywood movies is not exactly the reality of what's happening in, uh, in you know in the cities in India. It's it's one reality. I mean, there are people who okay, it's one reality, but it's not the, the reality of the whole country. But yet, it gives you an idea of what people consider as beautiful, what people consider as uh, fun. Uh, it gives you, um, you know, how people, for example, perceive relationships, uh, the body, uh, the body language, and um, um, personal space. Also, I mean, for me, uh, in Bollywood movies, not for me, but in Bollywood movies, for example, you will never see two people kissing. You know, they never kiss. It's just like a whole uh, dance around it, and it's so, you know, uh, from an emotional perspective, it's so, it's so intense. But people, because it's not something which is Accepted, you know, to, to, to show that on the screen. I mean, um, so even if it's not the reality of India, you get a sense of uh, uh, some cultural aspects of India. And beyond the movies, you also have the series, you know, with Netflix and all those things. You can get series from everywhere in the world. I think this is very uh, also um, enlightening. Show, yeah. uh, enlightening. And also with books, you know, novels, short novels. Uh, you can get also a sense of, uh, of things. I mean, I think honestly, um, from observing paintings or from really cultural productions are so useful when you want to understand a country. Yeah. Um, you know the books. You you do your homework. Huh? You can do your homework reading the book of uh, you know how to do business in France, how to do business in India. Uh, but really, really, you do the you, you you do your homework. Then you watch movies. You read books. You go to I mean you. You look at museums, no, you have a lot of museums which are available online. COVID-19 has been you know, a great step ahead for the access to cultural productions. Uh, go and see uh, you know, the, the, the shows, uh, listen to music, very important as well, the, the, the lyrics in the, lyric, in the music as well. And then speak to people, speak to real people. I think this is my, that would be my best way of doing it. Yeah, if I can just add to what you said, I think like while you do all your homework, you it's, it's very important what you just said. It's true that like, you need to really go in detail, understand what's there. But at the end, when you are in the country, keep an open mind because there are experiences of each person which differs from person to person. And when you reach there, you develop your own experience through the journey. And, um, and also because you, you, you have a lot of stereotypes. Exactly. Like, I'm sure Kadika, when she arrived in Paris, she was expecting you know everyone to eat baguettes <laughs> and uh, and to go to uh, <laughs> and, to <laughs> and to go to the Eiffel Tower uh, like once yeah. uh, per month or whatever. I've never been to the Eiffel Tower. I think this since like 20 years. You know, this is this is not. I mean, French people, you don't go. I mean, you, you go once in your life when you are a kid, and then you don't you don't go back. So. I'm just, yeah, stereotypes. Stereotypes are very... Um, exactly. Stereotypes always come from something which is true. Huh? There is always a reality. There is a mystery behind it. But hence, yeah, I think the uh, best way is to be open-minded and uh, open to different cultures. Flexible. Yes. Uh, thank you so much, Anne Fleur. I think with that, we are at the end of our masterclass, but uh, it has been a pleasure. Thank you, everyone, for watching. And to this uh, live would be available on replay whenever you want to look at it again. Um, thank you so much. Bye. Have a nice afternoon, evening uh, to all. Bye. Bye.